Okay, uh, thank you very much for joining today's webinar, Achieving Scale and Compliance During a Global Expansion with AWS and CoreLogix. Uh, this is going to be a live webinar, so you're more than welcome to ask us questions along the way. Uh, we can have an open discussion on, on each and every topic we'll cover today. Uh, with me, our guests here, uh, Roy, head of Dev Infra at Armour Security, and Yaniv, solution architect at AWS. Um, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Yaniv. Thanks so much, Ariel. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and thanks, CoreLogix, for having me over here. Um, so we're going to talk about scale and global scale, and I'm going to get started with one of the most popular ways for our customers to achieve scale, which is containers. And I'm going to cover some containers on AWS um, and some of the solutions that you can use for containers, as well as some of the integration points that you can use with our partners. So let's start off with the first question, which is why are companies actually moving to containers? We all know that container adoption is rapidly gr growing, but let's talk about the why. When we talk about why, we always have to talk about challenges. So the customers, that, um, the challenges that customers are facing that force them to use solutions like containers are, first of all, constant change. Customers want to be more agile so they can innovate and respond to changes faster. This year, especially with the virtual nature of everything and you know how uh, globally things have changed. For example, last year we've had uh, AWS reInvent being a virtual event, and I'm sure that some of you might have been attending virtual events such as this one instead of an in-person event. And that just caused companies to try and achieve scale and automation in a much larger way. More than ever, now organizations, because of all of that, they just want to move with speed and focus on innovating and delivering more applications um, just to production. And they also want to do it safely. So instead of focusing on managing things and managing um, underlying infrastructure and how all these servers are supposed to work together, uh, we see a more popular pattern of using containers. So the question is, what do customers actually ask us that caused us to invest a lot in containers? Well. They want the teams to, their teams to focus on delivering applications just as fast as possible. They don't want to get stuck along the way while they're building their applications. They need a proven track record of scaling to whatever size, whatever need, and to scale up and down rapidly also to save some costs without wasting unnecessary uh, resources. They also want security and isolation and control over access and permissions. And they basically, they try to remove as much as possible any human error that might, that might stop them from innovating. Because of these customers' needs, we've seen a very large push towards containers. By letting AWS handle all that infrastructure and operational burden and provide automation, customers are able to reduce their risks and focus on building business logic instead of building infrastructure. By moving to a controlled and repeatable environment and embracing automation, we see product delivery velocity dramatically increase, while also this is improving the quality, improving the stability, and improving security. So I talked about like why, and now let's talk about what customers are actually building with containers. Container services are core for customer strategies. They're building their most sensitive workloads and they're building their most physical critical applications as long as backend applications as well. So starting with application front, our customers are building the backend services that power their IT organizations and their consumer applications as well to basically drive the top line of growth. Many, many of our customers are also building shared services platforms just to help their dev teams move faster these platforms, they do things like automating the software deployment and infrastructure provisioning and provide guardrails for management, security, and governance as well. Customers are very often now containerizing their legacy applications, .NET, Linux, and Java application, and then moving them more easily to AWS using the containers. Recently, we've also seen machine learning as a very, very big use case. Just one example for it would be autonomous vehicles, which are a huge use case for container services um, in the past year. So let's talk about how customers are building um, containers on AWS. Now, this slide is a little bit overwhelming. So the expectation is that I'm not going to go and read through everything here. Uh, I just want 
basically for you to understand the breadth of services that we have and the different categories. There's no right way to build an AWS, but there's certainly plenty of options and you just have to stitch them together in, in order to make your solution happen. This is true for working with AWS services as well as it is true for working with AWS partners. For instance, if you need a good monitoring solution and you want to work with CoreLogix, we have a native integration with them and it's uh, pretty robust to give you visibility into all of this big ecosystem. But one important aspect of uh, container technology is actually picking the orchestrator. And that is something I want to focus on right now. Uh, when we talk about orchestrators, we have basically two different things or two different main orchestrators. One of them is called Amazon ECS or Elastic uh, Container Service. And the other one is Amazon EKS or Elastic Kubernetes Service. And the most common question that we hear is, hey, can you please help us choose which one is the right one for us? There isn't really a great answer. Um, both of them are integrated with AWS, with the AWS ecosystem and with AWS services. But there are things that we can do uh, to help you explore which ones to choose based on some experience that we've had with customers. Our customers tell us mostly about ECS, that they love the simplicity it provides, that it delivers kind of an AWS opinionated solution where you don't have to take a lot of decisions when you're trying to uh, create your environments. And it, it basically just reduces that and then allows for scale. So when you reduce the time to build, you reduce the time to deploy, and all these applications you already have running on containers using Docker, for instance, you can just ship them over to AWS. It makes it a simple choice if you just want to get started fast. It is designed for simplicity uh, from the start. So if we look at this uh, diagram here, basically what it's set to show is that you can work with ECS as your orchestrator, but then you can also integrate it with the rest of AWS. If you need a load balancer, you can use an elastic load balancer. If you need to orchestrate your builds and you want to use code pipeline or any other tool, you can also do that with ECS. And then you can also run it on top of either Fargate or EC2. And I'll, I'll talk about these compute options later on after I talk about EKS. So why do customers choose EKS and, and what would be kind of what would prompt you to take that decision of uh, starting with EKS? Usually it's Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a very vibrant ecosystem and community. It has consistent open source APIs and it has broad flexibility. And our, basically the users of Kubernetes rely on Amazon EKS to handle the undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing all that AWS part, but they can still manage their Kubernetes with the same control plane that they were used to before using AWS. With Kubernetes, and we do understand that customers coming into AWS are not um, using containers for the first time. So you also have a lot of integration points that you can use um, either with AWS services like the load balancers and the um, network load balancers, but also with open source tools and other partner tools such as GitHub and Jenkins, or if you need to do Flux for GitOps, et cetera. So I, I, I hinted that I'll talk about how you run your containers on AWS after you choose your orchestration engine. And we basically have a lot of options. And again, it really depends on kind of the requirements that each customer has. And based on that requirement, you choose your um, underlying technology. AWS Fargate, starting with, with the, the left side here of the slide, is a serverless container compute engine where you only pay for the resources requ required to run containers. Uh, if we take a look at the adoption of Fargate in the previous year, over 40% of customers that actually started to use containers on AWS started off with Fargate, just for the simplicity. You don't have to uh, deal with servers and with EC2s. So all, all you need to do is basically just um, tell Fargate how many uh, containers you're going to run. Whereas with EC2 instances, um, still customers like the flexibility. So we offer a wide variety of choice, whether you need to look at aspects of uh, processors, storage and networking, you can run it on ARM and AMD, and you can use our whole wide variety of EC2 instances, including spot instances as well. For customers that run containers in hybrid environments, what we launched a couple of years ago, AWS Outpost, and you can run your container infrastructure on-prem and in AWS and basically use the same control plane. 
where if a customer needs um, an extension of an AWS region, you can basically use local zone. This is more suited if you need the ability to plan resources in multiple locations and keep them closer to your uh, end users. With AWS Wavelength, um, the, lastly here on the slide, it's an ultra low latency mobile edge computing. So it's more geared towards edge and 5G use cases for mobile development. So when you run your containers and we talked about uh, choosing your orchestrator, then we talked about choosing kind of the underlying compute that runs everything. There are several common networking tasks that are associated with container applications. Container need to join a network in order to send and receive traffic. It's a basic thing. And for that, we use the Amazon VPC. Container applications, though, also need to be able to discover one another. And service discovery is very common, especially in microservices architectures. For that, you can use services like AWS App Mesh and AWS Cloud Map. For the essence of time, I won't dive into each one of the services. I'm just kind of scratching the services. Feel free to ask questions, and I can answer them later on. You also need to be able to load balance traffic um, based on either layer seven protocols like HTTP or NLBs um, based on layer four with protocols such as TCP and UDP. And the AWS load balancer uh, controllers can help you with that. Lastly here, I just wanna cover a typical uh, pipeline for automating deployment with AWS. So you can either use the AWS suite of tools if you want to run your containers. We provide native services for running your code, deploying your code, and then later on monitoring it. But the same as you do that, you can also use a lot of open source and third-party developer tools as well that can integrate within your pipeline. For example, VS Code and IntelliJ for authoring, or if you're building with Jenkins or with Circle CI, you can use those solutions as well for deploying your containers in AWS, all the way through monitoring your containers where you can use uh, solutions such as CoreLogix, a native integration with ECS and Fargate, and monitor your applications running on AWS. And with that, I want to transfer it over to Roy from Armis. Take it away, Roy. Hi, thank you very much, Aniv, and um, thank you all for joining us. So I'm uh, Roy Amitai. I'm uh, head of Dev Infra in Armis. And in the next 15 minutes, I will try to go over um, three very, very interesting use cases for how Armis uses CoreLogix to improve of our uh, CI CD pipeline and even for cost optimizations. But before we start, let's uh, talk a little bit about Armis. So, what Armis is for you, for uh, those of you who don't know what Armis is, so Armis is a unified visibility security platform, obviously, right? But not really. What you want to know is that Armis helps organizations, big organizations, um, our customers are Fortune 10, Fortune 15 companies. Uh, we use them to identify um, all of their um, devices in the network and uh, to help them secure those devices. Um, and you probably ask, how do we do that, right? So Armis uses three main uh, parts um, uh, of, this, of our um, solution to do that. The first one is to discover those assets. But what are those assets? Those are the devices in the organization. Um, those devices are anything that is connected to the uh, customer network or in the proximity of that network. Um, and um, if you try to think about it, uh, the first device that comes in your head when you, when I say device, is probably laptops, right? But laptops is an easy problem. You install an agent. This uh, solution exists for years, for years. Uh, this agent collects metrics. It collects the type of the hardware of the. Um, a uh, laptop, it collects the application that runs, uh, wh which websites you access to. Um, it also um, uses very smart uh, algorithm to see uh, if you're using your laptop correctly. But this is very easy because this is the agent on the laptop doing everything. But um, let's see what other devices we know. Uh, what about MRI machines in hospitals? Uh, what about breathing machines in hospitals? Uh, you wouldn't want any hacker to hack into uh, your breathing machine, right? And uh, on the other hand, you cannot install just like that any agent on those devices. So uh, Armis uh, um, actually listens to the traffic, the internal traffic um, on the network of the customer 
And um, by doing uh, uh, very smart things, what we do, we actually identify thousands and thousands of different parameters on those devices. We create a huge list of all those assets with this information. Um, the second part that we uh, do is use this list to identify risk and gaps. How we do that? Again, we have that information, right? So we can use it to see if the devices um, are acting uh, in a bad way. They can access different, um, they can access IPs which are on bad lists. Um, those devices could be um, transferring huge amount of data, and, but which we're not used to see them do. Uh, we use machine learning and smart AI in order to detect those abnormal behaviors. And uh, we um, integrate this with uh, more simple metrics like OS versions and vulnerability lists to actually uh, come up with a risk factor for each of those devices. Uh, the system admin of the network can uh, um, just go in the Armis console and in a click of a button, he will get a list of all those devices, all the uh, risk and gaps in the organization which he needs to um, know, be aware of. Right. The third part is that we automate the enforcement. We use the, uh, the customer's uh, network. Um, by the way, we do it passively. We do it all the time, continuously and in real time. We identify in real time. Uh, we enforce. Uh, we, do the, we do it using the uh, network equipment so we can do anything that the network equipment allows us to do. We can block, we can quarantine, we can just um, tag or label, we could run a script. Um, we can help our customers uh, mitigate those problems. Um, some facts about armies. Um, we are 450 employees worldwide. Actually, we're a little bit more than that, but uh, we grow all the time, so I need to update this number. Uh, 250 of those are R and D are located in the R and D center here in Tel Aviv. Um, my uh, group um, is 20 engineers. Uh, we are located at both locations, in the U.S. and in Israel. Uh, we have DevOps. We have software engineers. We develop the internal tools for armies uh, that helps armies achieve. Uh, the results that we uh, achieve. Uh, we've been founded six years ago by Evgeny Dubrov and Nadir Israel, and we are evaluated at 2 billion. But the most amazing part of that evaluation is that the growth during the past year was 200%. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our infrastructure. We are running 100% on AWS. We used to run on other um, cloud providers, but um, we found out that AWS um, you know, gives us the best uh, results. Um, we use a massive, massive data pipeline in our event-driven application. Uh, we process um, 10 billion events uh, per day. Um, and if you think about it, it actually makes sense, right? Because we listen to the internal traffic of the biggest organization in the world. Uh, and we do that by using cutting edge technologies. We look at ourselves as a startup company. We do, uh, we are very dynamic. Uh, we are not afraid uh, to change technologies and adopt, adopt new technologies. And we do it all the time in order to achieve better uh, results. But um, all of that together make you probably understand that our main challenge is scale. Anything you do small is easy, right? Every, any, it, uh, the second that it uh, uh, gets bigger, um, it gets more difficult. Um, Armis has partnered with CoreLogix about three years ago. Uh, I can say that we are very, very happy with this partnership. Uh, I actually know uh, CoreLogix and I worked with CoreLogix uh, for a year before I joined Armis. Um, but I can say that um, since I joined, we replaced uh, um, Splunk as our, our log uh, solution with CoreLogix. Splunk took us about six months to um, integrate. Um, CoreLogix, uh, I think it took like two weeks. Um, so we are very, very happy with, uh, with our decision. Uh, we process uh, 2.7 billion daily logs. Uh, which are 3.7 terabytes, but we only index 25% of those. We use TCO, 
to do that, and we'll talk about it later. Uh, we ship uh, multiple types of logs uh, from OS logs, infrastructure logs, AWS logs, um, our misapplication logs, our build system sends logs. Every uh, line of log that our misproduce is being shipped to CoreLogix. Uh, we use those logs to improve our development process, and I can uh, and I can uh, say that um, since we started using CoreLogix, we see how our our time to market has uh, improved, and uh, um, we will talk about it later and how we've done that. Uh, we also uh, use six different teams in CoreLogix. Um, we do that mainly because we want to uh, to use different quarantines for each of those logs. Uh, those are different types of logs. It's actually interesting to see uh, your growth through the data. So uh, yeah. years ago it was 500 gigs, and now it's seven times uh, bigger. It's uh, for us, it's very easy to see a company that grows exponentially from the data. So that's that's really impressive. So actually, um, the most impressive part of this um, is that uh, we never changed the, the, the plan, right? Yes. It's so a, that's amazing. Uh, we will talk about it later, how we do that. But uh, if you think about the growth that Armis went through, the 200% in the last year, um, probably more than 500% in the last three years, uh, we didn't change the plan. So yeah. That's, Interesting, we'll talk about it. Um, let's talk about the, some use cases, right? Uh, the first one is how we use CoreLogix in our development process. Our, our um, developers who um, are, their main goal is to write uh, high quality um, uh, code, uh, new features, they need to be focused on that. And how do you use CoreLogix to improve on, that, on this? Uh, so the problem is very easy, right? Uh, well, it's very difficult to solve it, but the problem is easy. Uh, there are a hundred of thousands of um, different uh, services, different pods in our microservice environment. We have uh, multiple EKS clusters, one in 150,000 services each. Um, and this is a really, really big ecosystem. And when you get to sit down and try the new feature, um, finding the right log that you're looking for, that you uh, need in order to do your work um, is not so easy, right? Um, we need to keep those uh, developers focused on what they do best, as I mentioned, and help them find exactly what they're looking for as fast as possible is very important. The uh, last part of the problem is that in order to do that, before they used to, uh, they used uh, kubectl, they used SSH, they used a lot of different um, uh, methods, unsecure, um, content switching, um, not very good. Uh, we sat down, we start planning our solution. We wrote down an RFC, we knew what we want. We wanted an easy to use solution that our developers will adopt um, very fast, easy for them to adopt. It would run local. It was very important for us that it will be a CLI and not UI, a web UI based, um, because we know uh, it's. Uh, we, we know that they prefer working on their terminal, right? Um, but the most important thing, and this is something that, as the DevOps in the organization, uh, this is something. This is kind of our uh, one of our goals is to. Um, enable the developers to do their work without them needing to adopt new uh, behavior, right? They need to do whatever they used to do um, and we would adopt the solution. Um, there was no, solu there, there was no uh, um, uh, solution for that problem, uh, but um, I picked up the phone. I called Ariel. I don't know if you remember that, actually. I remember, actually. Um, so, yeah. If there was only the same thing that you guys given the UI, only the CLI, we would have used it. Yes. So um, I, I, don't, I actually don't know how no one else have this, right? It's, uh, it's something that is very unique to, to CoreLogix, but the most unique part about it, it was that Ariel immediately received, accepted the challenge, um, and two, three days after, yes. you've got a solution. So CoreLogix uh, provided us with a CLI tool. Uh, we worked together um, in order to, um, to get whatever exactly whatever we need from this CLI tool. We knew that we're going to wrap this tool with our own ARMY CLI, ASLI. Um, and by doing that, we actually 
were able to switch um, uh, the services to write the logs in a JSON format. This is uh, very important because originally what we used to do was to parse those logs, right? A lot of companies do the same. They have um, FluentD or um, FileBeat, and what they do is just uh, use uh, long and very complex regex in order to um, index those, those, uh, those strings into their uh, log system, right? So that is something we wanted uh, to, uh, you know, improve. And uh, because those are something we need to manage constantly. Every time there's a new log, something didn't work, and we need to manage this. So by writing the, j the logs in a JSON format, uh, we solve this problem. Um, but developers don't want to see JSON, right? It's not an easy thing to process. It's not something they used to do. Um, so we used our, our client in order to, our CLI in order to change this JSON back to a line format. So we actually did the, the other way around, right? But it's uh, it turns out really nice. And let me show you what we actually do. So writing the log used to be just a string. Uh, this is an example for us writing, this is the army logger. Uh, we're writing an info log, info level uh, log, which is very simple, right? Uh, users uh, um, log in using one, two, three. Um, we log the user ID, uh, the method, and then um, we use the regex in order to index this um, this log. Um, the new uh, type of logs are uh, a little bit different. What we did, we actually changed the string with a JSON. And this is really easy because now this log is being automatically indexed into the system the right way we want it to be. Uh, querying those logs on the developer's laptops uh, it's very easy. Uh, this is an example using the Asli. Uh, we are working, we're choosing our service, which is just a test service in this, in this case. Uh, we want to see the logs, which is the environment, which is prod, which is the severity, which is all logs above info level. We could also, uh, we could also specify the uh, namespace, uh, in this case operation, and some other um, different uh, filters. But um, eventually what we get, and you can see it in the um, screenshot, is just a log, right? More the, exactly what they want. They could use grep, they could use awk, they could st store this into a file, they could do whatever they want with it. And they are very, very happy, and that makes me happy. Um, so uh, I think this is really, really nice uh, use case. And I don't know if other uh, customers are using this. Um, so you guys are the first ones, but now we're starting to see a lot more uh, adoption of that. The, the, the cool thing about it is that a lot of our uh, uh, methodology here in CarLogix is to not force, mm -hmm. just like you guys are yeah. saying, you, know, you don't want to force people to work your way. And that's, that's more of a platform engineering approach than it is of uh, 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 pure engineering that wants everyone to do uh, what he thinks that's right. And so uh, we enable multiple ways to consume data. So you can use RUI if you want to plug in Kibana or Grafana or an SQL client or a Tableau or obviously the CLI, or you want to use a pure API, then you can do everything you want. And by enabling this additional method of doing things that is outside the browser, unlike all other things, mm -hmm. uh, that feedback actually helped us create something that developers really like because now developers just install the CoreLogic CLI and use it as some sort of centralized grep for all machines, all services at once. Exactly. They can actually do uh, things that they were, it was very hard for them to do uh, before they can choose, uh, let's say they are working on a specific service, but they need to see the logs from uh, multiple no. servers at the same time, uh, from uh, you know hundreds of replication. They could do that, get it to their browser, the, to their um, terminal, um, and it's just, it, I think they they well, they love it. They just use it all day. Um, let's talk about the second use case. So uh, this the second use case is about our build system, um, and and I would like to show how we use CoreLogic in in order to improve um, our CI/CD pipeline. 
And uh, I think the most difficult uh, problem that company face is the build system, right? Um, companies improve on the build all the time. Also, it's something that falls somewhere between the DevOps and the developers. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, testing goes in, in, in the process. It's very difficult to improve on that. And I think most companies just lack the um, um, observability and the ability to actually identify and pinpoint the problems. That's very interesting, by the way. It's a huge blind spot with many companies. And also many of the CI CD tools don't even support extracting those stats and uh, the build mm -hmm. logs. And then, you know, everyone talks so much about developer productivity. There's nothing less productive than a developer waiting for a build. Exactly. So exactly. that's, that's really when, when you guys started doing this, we looked at it. So we always had like the plugin for Jenkins and circle CI and others to extract the metrics. But this was, uh, one of the first times we've actually seen a full dashboard and, uh, uh, of, of how do we track everything from PyTest to the build itself, to the build logs mm -hmm. and link all the way to the build in Jenkins so you can you can look at problems and isolate them. Yeah, we will see a screenshot in a second, um, but uh, maybe before I will just give some uh, numbers about our build system, just so uh, you'll understand what we were working with, right? So Armis uh, um, code is being stored on a mono repo. Um, we chose that a um, long time ago um, and we love it, right? But uh, we use Bazel as our build, uh, uh, build tool. But using a mono repo is very hard on the build system because every time you need to build the entire repository. So we are building uh, hundreds of services, containers. Uh, we have a multiple different um, type of uh, uh, code inside, right? We use Python, we have, um, we have Go, we have a Node. Um, everything is uh, inside the same repo, repo right? Uh, we use Jenkins to build our code. Uh, our Jenkins is huge cluster running 400 daily builds uh, on an average, uh, and we've seen seen it go uh, much higher than that. Um, it scales automatically. 50% um, of our build take less than seven minutes, which is the results today. And I will show what were the statistics before. Um, optimizing it. Our longest build takes 25 minutes, our shortest takes two minutes. Uh, we're running 35,000 tests per build. Um, quick calculation right there, um, helping you out. 14 million daily tests. Some are longer, some are shorter, um, but 14 million is a big number. Uh, we're building 300 service container, different service container, right? We uh, This is a uh, um, 120,000 daily service container that we are creating um, every day. Uh, we ship all of our logs, and when I say all of our logs, I mean our test logs, our pipeline logs, our code container building logs, our Bazel logs, all of the logs are being shipped into um, to, um, CoreLogix. Uh, those logs are being processed, indexed, turned into metrics, and then what we do, uh, we use them in a, a very um, big, I can say, um, dashboard. And that dashboard actually enables us to pinpoint the problem, the exact problems. Uh, first of all, what we done, uh, we went and we search for those, uh, you know, 10, uh, 90, for those 10% uh, percent of uh, uh, problem that creates a 90% real time, right? That was a quick win for us. Um, but I can, um, but I, I can show you an example of that dashboard. This is, uh, it's, it, it, you can scroll down. This is just a screenshot, right? But um, there's a lot, a lot of metrics there. Uh, but it's very easy because of the vi uh, visualization to see if you have a problem in the build uh, system, if something, if a service breaks, if someone introduced a new test uh, that takes longer than the others, um, we have, uh, everything. We have everything. The, the we slowest have everything. test, uh, how many builds you do per time, which mm -hmm. shows you if you have a scale issue, what is the P95, P99 of, of slowest uh, deployments, the slowest builds. Um, you can look at how many tests had failed, how many had succeeded. Uh, you can look at where you're spending time on your build, like what's the longest yeah. stages, slowest stages. And then because of the flexibility, you guys chose to use Kibana here. 
which plugs into Coral Logics because mm -hmm. the flexibility of Kibana, you can just zoom into areas where you want to look at deeper. So if you see like a slow uh, a build or if you see a slow stage, you just zoom into it. Exactly. You get a link to the build itself. Exactly. You can start investigating. Yeah, yeah. a good example could be, uh, uh, we do multiple uh, filters here, but a good example for what you just uh, mentioned is, uh, uh, for example, uh, we have a, a specific test that we want to see how it performs across time. Because right now I see this test is uh, pretty slow in compared to other tests. I'm coming to the developer is saying, well, but it was very good previously, right? So I could immediately show him how the test, exactly the version uh, that uh, the, his branch, exactly the branch that he created that broke the, the, the test or um, made the test uh, longer. So it's really easy. And if you think about it, I don't think there was any other way of doing it before because usually uh, you find out about those problems too late. And then you need to go back months and search for that, you know. And many times people just accept the slow build and they just drink another cup of coffee. That's coffee. what usually happens, <laughs> right. And how, how does the, the stats look like? Like what's, where did you start and, and where are you today in terms of uh, the build time? Yeah, so let's talk about the results. Um, very easy. And I think those numbers shows everything here. Um, build time. A year ago, I'm not talking like three years ago, a year ago, the build time took two hours. Today, about five minutes. So that, on, that's on, the million. On 250 million. engineers, if you save yeah. uh, one hour and 55 minutes for build time, we're talking like months of work a year. It's that's insane. And frustration and uh, DevOps time trying to resolve those, those issues. Uh, dev developers looking for searching for the places where the taste tests uh, broke, things like that. So yeah, years of time, years of time. That's amazing. Um, you can also see that, and I think this is really good a, a metric for um, uh, a mono repo, right? Because on mono repo, when you build everything, it's really important that uh, you took care of all the dependencies. In that way, you caching, you only build whatever you whatever was changed, right? So uh, we went down from cash, five percent being cached, meaning nine percent of the uh, code was uh, being built every time, to nine percent. Now only ten percent is actually being built, even though it's a model. And actually, it's lower than that, but uh, I'm very conservative about the numbers here. Um, we also. Uh, we were also able to uh, see how we can improve the pipeline itself. Uh, we used to have um, three steps running in parallel in some places uh, um, along the, the pipeline. Today, we have more than 20 things happening in parallel. So we have much, much more steps, but it takes much less time because it works in parallel. Um, let's talk about TCO a little bit. Right? Yeah, sure. And I think TCO is, uh, where, when it was introduced? TCO is one year old. One today, year old. Actually. It's amazing. Um, it was the 3rd of November, 2020. It's, it's amazing. And I think TCO is one of the reasons why we haven't had uh, to um, change our plan. To right? uncontrollably upgrade. Yeah. That's what people hate most about logs and metrics product, right? Because you start and you scale. But we have a saying here in CoreLogix that data grows faster than revenue. So uh, that's true. <laughs> no matter how much your company is growing, data is going to grow faster than that. And that's why we came up with uh, uh, TCL. Yeah, we are a data-driven company. So uh, there's a lot of data involved there. Um, we use TCO. Um, I think that without TCO, we would have paid about four times what we pay now. Actually, you actually see that really. Yeah, much so, so let's talk a little bit about the problem so people will understand. Uh, well, we, we, we talked about the growth of Armis. Uh, we're producing more and more logs every day. We write new features. We have in, we are introducing new services all the time. Two services write logs. We have more users, more your, more, more logs, um, and we need to uh, and, and and we need to control those logs, right? So the way we could do that is limit the type of logs that we're still the severity of the log that we're sending. But it was very hard to do before we used TCO because that was uh, we had to do that on the client side. That is um, that required the de uh, deploy cycle, which took time. Um, now we do it using TCO on the server side. Um, also, one more problem was that if we uh, if we uh, found like a um, spamming spamming um, log, 
when we blocked it, we actually uh, wasn't able to see it in the uh, Taylor, right? Uh, now, with TCO, we can do that. We can not index the, the log, but we can still see it on Taylor. Still so get all developers the developers are using on, it. Yeah. On, the, on the CLI, right? So we can see it in the CLI, but it's not being indexed. We don't need to index it, right? We can do whatever we want. We see the log, we choose what we want to do with it. If it's log that we create metrics from, we don't need to index it. If it's log that needs to be um, archived um, and just um, you know seen in real time, then we can archive this log uh, and you can query it later, right? There's a new feature. Uh, yeah, there's a new feature it's actually really enabling new. the queries directly from the archive. Yeah, so we use that. We can query the logs from the uh, S3, from the archive, directly from the console. So this is an amazing solution for us, right? Uh, also, we, um, the, we, we had another problem, which is uh, mainly in the test, in the development um, team in CoreLogix. Um, because it was worked all the time, uh, a lot of bugs were introduced. Uh, we couldn't um, uh, anticipate uh, a certain service uh, spamming, and then yeah, exploding. spamming, yeah. and then it uh, it filled the quota, and then um, you know it, it's very hard if you don't have logs. So yes. <laughs> that's the most difficult thing. You cannot uh, do your work without logs. Uh, the solution, obviously, using TCO, right? Uh, I can say that now we only index 25% of those logs. Uh, the rest are being shipped either to metrics, uh, medium level, or um, low level, just yeah, to so archive uh, and tail. There's, there are three levels of, of uh, processing that we offer. One is the full index data replicated on the fastest query possible because that index doesn't do anything besides user queries. The second level is only the monitoring. Um, so we extract the metrics, uh, anomalies, alerts, live tail, uh, and obviously the direct archive queries. And the, the lowest level of processing is what we call the compliance use case, where the data goes to the live tail and the archive and can be queried directly from the archive. And each level introduces a, a certain uh, discount. Um, and that way you can basically get uh, six times the data without having to extend the package. Yeah, and you can configure those per um, application and per subsystem. Per application, right? service, and severity. And severity. And you is... have a full API to create these policies. Right? Yeah, and we can use this API. Um, here in the, uh, in the uh, screenshot, you can uh, see um, the, the, the blue, sorry, uh, the blue line uh, shows the growth of the um, amount of logs we we actually send to CoreLogix, but it's at the over same time, four terabytes. Yeah, time, a, and, yeah, and at the same time, you can see the purple line go down, right? Uh, the purple line is actually what we what are we being counted. Yeah, being being counted for, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, one goes up, the other goes down, and uh, and it's really amazing. And we're not missing any line of log. This is what's important to understand here. You can also see there's uh, an anomaly in the middle of the screenshot. And you can see it just affected the number of logs uh, being shipped to CoreLogic, but it did not actually affect the number of uh, logs that were being counted for, right? Because we implemented an automatic solution uh, where we actually use CoreLogix alerts uh, the uh, anomaly detection, uh, higher than usual alert, more than usual, more than usual alert. Then we use this alert in order to, uh, and also we use a, uh, it triggers an ecologic webhook, right? And this webhook actually turns on the TCO specifically for this log. Oh, so if there's one app that spikes suddenly, we, we identify, identify the anomaly, yeah. and then we block or move it to a yeah. lower use case. Or We also send a Slack message to the developer, nice. and when he fixes this, uh, the, it, uh, goes it goes back. We automatically identify that it's been resolved, and the TCO rule has been removed. That's amazing. And you can see this in action right here in the graphs. So it's, uh, it's really nice, actually. Um, that was the third use case. Um, I would like to thank you all um, for giving me the chance to tell you a little bit about CoreLogix and Armies and how and what we do together. Let's, talk, let's, get, let's take some questions and see if we yes. have any questions from Q and A crowd. So, question time. See one. It's CoreLogix only for logs, or does it only also support metrics? Yes, yeah, so um, this one. CoreLogix, <laughs> yeah, the, the main one is, uh, is, is uh, on this presentation, we spoke a lot about logs, some a bit about metrics and Jenkins, 
Uh, CoreLogix obviously support metrics uh, with a native uh, integration to Prometheus. You just use the standard node exporters and Prometheus uh, uh, integration to CoreLogix. And you can plug CoreLogix to any dashboard, like I mentioned. So one of them is uh, Grafana. You can use Grafana with CoreLogix to query the metrics you send with Prometheus, query the metrics that you converted from logs with CoreLogix logs to metrics. And you can do that in the Lucene syntax, SQL syntax, or even PromQL uh, directly from uh, uh, your Grafana, Kibana, SQL clients, or the CoreLogix UI. Um, so obviously we support metrics, very high cardinality, uh, very high scale. Um, and uh, we charge per gigabyte also for metrics with very high compression rates. So we're basically lowering it down to about a fifth of the closest uh, competitor in, when it comes to price, just like we do with log data. Let's see if there's anything. Um, is CoreLogix available in the AWS marketplace? Yes. So yes, it um, is. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're using the AWS Marketplace. I can say this is very, very um, convenient. Uh, convenient for us to do. Um, and uh, it was actually offered by your sales team. So I'm... Yeah, I'm so thrilled. the idea is that, you know, uh, beyond just making it simpler to do the expense and track it and, and, and uh, uh, do the billing cycle more simply, um, when you work with CoreLogix through the AWS Marketplace, uh, it gets counted for your quota uh, if you have an enterprise agreement with Splunk and uh, with uh, AWS, I'm sorry, and you have some sort of uh, spend that you have to do. And uh, another benefit that you get by using the uh, AWS Marketplace is that you use the standard agreement of AWS. So uh, that falls under the terms and conditions that you know and trust, and AWS has approved the, those terms and conditions. Um, so you don't need to go through the entire legal and security process on your own. And CoreLogix has DevOps competency um, in AWS, which approved CoreLogix's uh, architecture, security, availability, and support. Um, so uh, it's something you can obviously yeah, trust. The fact that it's been counted for the EDP is also a really good factor here. Yeah. Uh, so it's really, really, really nice. Um, let's see what else we got. Is the TCO feature dynamic? Can I modify it on the fly? Yeah, exactly. So um, it, just like uh, Roy mentioned, um, it's dynamic. You can use uh, uh, the uh, user interface that we introduced to it, uh, or you can create policies uh, uh, using even an API. So you can uh, basically create an API call that says all uh, records arriving from a specific application, specific component, at debug severity, now go directly to the archive without being indexed. And once your quota uh, uh, cycle ended, you can open it up again and so on, or use anomaly detection to do that on the fly. Um, what about, about alerts and dashboards for the logs you don't store? Um, so that's what's unique about CoreLogix Streamer. The technology behind this CCO feature uh, does all the uh, stateful analytics uh, in stream. So that includes not just the uh, 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 live tail, but also alerts, anomaly detection, uh, logs to metrics extraction, and writing it to remote storage, uh, in this case, S3. And then, of course, you can query it directly from that S3 uh, 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 archive inside the CoreLogix UI using syntaxes, such as Lucene, even for data that was never indexed or never stored. Uh, 